to have you here with our Stead Talks, Spine, Technology, Education, and the D, as I always emphasize, is for discovery, discussion, and debate. And today we have a great visiting professor, uh, Dr. Avi Chavda, from Dallas, Texas with us. I will introduce him in greater depth later, but he's an interventional pain management specialist uh, with fellowship training from Johns Hopkins, and he practices in the frozen tundra of Dallas, Texas, where he has withstood ice and snow to get to his workplace, and he's uh, uh, already live with us. Um, and he's going to talk about something that we all need to learn more about and understand better, and that is the epidural space and its relationship to patients' uh, pain symptoms around our neural elements. So we're going to emphasize the dura, and we have four interesting cases that all look at different angles of the epidural space, not necessarily directly in what Dr. Chavda, I assume, is going to talk about. I've not heard his lecture before, but uh, about how the dura can affect the well-being or lack thereof of our patients. So I think the first patient is um, going to be presented by Dr. Jim Hicks, and uh, he is originally from Alabama, so he came from the south. How's Alabama doing snow-wise and ice-wise? Do you have the same cold spell? A little chilly, but not coming in here. So not as bad as Texas. Okay. So Dr. Hicks, Dr. Chavda is live also, and we're going to talk about some implications pertinent to him, but then also generally to spine surgery later. Okay. So Dr. Hicks. Wonderful. All right. I'll jump right into it. If you can get this pulled up. All right. So starting off with the uh, first presentations, it'll be short and sweet. 56-year-old um, uh, uh, Asian female uh, with a history of OPLL develops uh, thoracic myelopathy, undergoes um, a thoracic fusion decompression. And to summarize the next two paragraphs, she undergoes uh, two separate neurologic declines. Uh, the first one postoperatively um, a couple days after she does get steroids and completes that. Um, then she's also noted uh, later uh, after the first revision to have a neurologic decline in rehabilitation uh, for what she returns to the operating room as well. Uh, so this is her examination after the first procedure. She starts to have a neurologic decline. As you can see, she's getting weaker in her lower extremities. And then she uh, does develop hyperreflexia. Uh, as well with second examination, um, indicating uh, that upper motor neuron uh, compression and spinal cord compression. Um, moving onward, this is her original imaging with the ossified posterior longitudinal ligament, uh, very extensive uh, disease here and very compressive. Uh, these are some slides on the uh, fusion that she uh, at first undergone and then we have a uh, workup um, MRI on the uh, right uh, showing a perhaps a compressive etiology in the upper thoracic spine. Um, and then the postoperative CT scan is also performed as per our usual um, protocol here. So uh, let me just stop you. So uh, first of all, good morning. Actually, it's uh, not good morning for Dr. Uh, professor Yong Hai from Beijing. It's an honor and pleasure to have you here. He's the professor and chairman of the Capital Medical Center and University in Beijing. So uh, uh, Yong Hai, it's great to have you with us. Um, and if you want to be moved over to the um, panelists, uh, we'd be happy to do that. Dr. Skuyan, so uh, go back to the CT, please, Jimmy. This is yes. a multi-level bad OPLL. and um, just briefly, would you agree with the basic concept of a multi-level posterior decompression and fusion as opposed to going in the front? And why would you not feel compelled to kind of resect the front uh, part? Take my microphone. Oh, no. All right, I got it. Um. <laughs> so uh, OPLO is very difficult to treat um, in general, whether you're going anterior or posterior. Usually, uh, in my experience, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to go into a case like this. So I think, I think doing a decompression infusion is uh, probably a wise thing to consider. Mm -hmm. I know there's some controversy. Um, you know, some people would do uh, a laminectomy, but I think, you know, if someone who's got progressive neurologic decline, 
you're going to do more than three levels laminectomy, I think it's not unreasonable to consider fusing it and instrumenting it. So in principle, uh, that's great. Um, Dr. Young, hi, are you, uh, you deal with a lot of OPL, so are you in uh, concurrence with doing a multi-level posterior decompression and fusion? Yes, yes, we do uh, have uh, quite a bit uh, this kind of uh, procedure and uh, we do uh, even from cervical to thoracic to lumbar spine and all the way, but we will do the stage. They will probably will do the cervical first and then the thoracic and the lumbar. You're working down. Uh, you, two weeks later. And you fuse those patients, right? And why do you fuse those patients? Uh, the the um the especially for the thoracic and thoracic uh spine if we uh, do the decompression and sometimes if there's a posterior uh, OPIL in the uh, in the uh, uh, region we needed to do uh, a bilateral uh, just like a canal type of uh, decompression to take out the uh, um, the osteophytes and then uh, the, probably they were causing disable of the thoracic spine so we will fuse them we almost only probably single level or isolated uh, levels not attached to uh, next to each other uh, we will do a simple decompression otherwise we will fuse them now the surgeon who did this surgery is not here with us right now but um he had a dural tear. What is the problem with OPLL and the dura? It, it seems to be very common that the dura is not really intact there. Is that a surgical mistake or is this almost expected in your experience? Uh, for the uh, dural tear in the OPLL, uh, especially in the thoracic spine, uh, even with the ossification of the uh, ligament foramen, it's it's very common because um, sometimes they uh, attach each other together, and normally we will do a, a careful CT scan and MI scan before the surgery to see if there's any uh, uh, gap between the dura and the ossification uh, sites, and uh, if there's um, no gap on that, probably we will leave some piece of the uh, a bone there, um, let them floating up or down. So we will um, keep the uh, pressure out of the spinal cord. So that's um, that's what we we see in the practice. So great. So we have a uh, an enormous amount of agreement. Now comes a curveball here. So. James, take us forward. So the surgeon did a nice decompression, right. and the patient actually seems to have done pretty well. Yeah, for the first couple of days. For the first mm -hmm. couple of days, and then the patient got worse. So mm -hmm. take us forward, Jim. Mm -hmm. What happened? So she's, uh, based on examination, she's showing signs of uh, persistent spinal cord compression that's, that's uh, worsening. And so an MRI is uh, obtained, and there's, uh, within the laminectomy sites, uh, compressive etiology, perhaps, uh, on these, uh, on this post-operative MRI, um, the uh, before we get to the second uh, neurologic decline, uh, she was uh, returned to the OR, and this was debrided, and there was. Do you have uh, a CT of this? Uh, so I do not have the. I have there another CT, CT of the dural uh, issues later on. Yeah, no. So we, we did obtain a CT that's sadly not here. So the mm -hmm. colleague in question uh, couldn't repair the dura, which I think is very understandable. So there was some membrane. I don't know what uh, type was on. It doesn't matter. And bone graft uh, was put onto the dural sac uh, mm -hmm. posteriorly. And we felt that most likely this bone graft, as it was congealing and uh, mm -hmm. getting better with the patient, mainly laying on her back, started compressing the cord. Right. Um, so I'll ask the surgeon here, uh, Dr. Yong Hai, do you ever put bone graft on the dura for healing to kind of help uh, a dural repair? I, I'd never heard that before, but have you uh, done that? Is that something that you've seen in your travels around the world? No, no, no. I, I haven't seen any. Uh, normally, we will put some uh, um, 
the uh, the uh, membrane stuff the for the dural tear or we will uh, have some um, fascia or or even muscle to attach to the leg and then you just need to close uh, the uh, soft tissue the muscles uh, tightly and keep the drain uh, flu um, as as much as possible just don't leave any uh, cavity uh, big cavities around there because if you leave cavity there they will causing uh, maybe uh, some pressure on the spinal cord uh, i haven't seen any uh, bone grafting to do that sometimes uh, some people will do like use a a a, a big diameter a mesh cage we will cut in between and the flow up like a, like a roof cover onto the leg that will um just just keep the space um, intact prevent any uh, pressure on the spinal cord and so can we concur uh dr Skuyan, uh, obviously as a neurosurgeon yeah. uh, have you ever heard of putting bone graft on to help uh, dural reconstruction um not usually usually i um put it we put it laterally um but no i typically um yeah. you know in a case like this I put the bone graft in mm -hmm. and then i put the um decorticate and then i put the hardware um uh medial to the bone graft Packing it so i i took the patient to the operating room urgently because she was deteriorating she was a very a very nice patient obviously and very communicative um, she spoke uh, Mandarin only, so we had to use an interpreter, but she was very clear how she was deteriorating. Mm -hmm. So we mm -hmm. peeled the bone graft off, we saw the dural defects, mm -hmm. and I didn't have any closure option, there's nothing to yeah. sew. Uh, so we did exactly, uh, Dr. Yonghai, what you said, and that is we put a membrane on, we put some glue on there, we did an extremely tight muscle and fascial closure. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we kept the patient at bed rest for 24 hours. We didn't put a suction drain in. Mm -hmm. And what happened then, Jim? So she improved and then she was discharged from the hospital to rehabilitation. Luckily, it was within this facility. Um, and then she also had a neurologic decline there uh, described as a sensory deficit starting in around the T6 level. And a uh, repeat scan at that point showed a uh, what we believe to be a compressive pseudomeningocele upon surgical exploration. Uh, this is, again was uh, repaired, uh, was decompressed, and then uh, repaired extensively with graft. And then she did improve uh, officially again. So here I first have a question for Dr. Yonghai, and then I'll ask uh, Avi for some questions. Um, so here we did exactly what you said uh professor young high we did a very nice cleanup of the dural elements the neural elements we decompressed wider to the sides a little bit around the front even and then we we knew that we had nothing to repair there from the previous surgeon from the pathology of the patient so we did a nice layered closure over a commercially available neural membrane and i actually used fat graft on the sides so, uh, and uh, a glue, um, a fibrin type recombinant glue, and again, very tight closure. She had no leakage, she had no headaches, mm -hmm. but she developed a secondary neurologic deterioration. So how can that be? How can a pseudomeningocele create a secondary cord compromise? How is that possible hydro hydrologically? Uh, this, is a, this is a very, very good question because uh, we, we did uh, experience some similar situation before. Uh, we cannot uh, give a definitive answer for this question. And, and sometimes when you decompress a um, very narrow spinal cord canal, and it will have what we call the recirculation of the spinal cord because the uh, delayed uh, uh, problem uh, of the neurological uh, function and this has happened a lot uh, in the uh, deformity correction uh, surgery because you know i i did a lot of uh, uh, severe deformity we if we correct too much even we release uh, open up the canal and they were delayed like uh, maybe one day or two day even longer time it delayed i think this is because the uh, the local uh, blood circulation or the circulation to the spinal cord has been changed, and because the uh, 
the narrowing of the spinal cord before surgery uh, decreased the ability for the spinal cord to, um, to adjust the certain change of the environment. But still, we don't have any uh, evidence to support that. Thank you. No, thank you. So, Rod, yeah. um, neurosurgically, can we explain how a pseudomeningocele nicely contained can cause a secondary cord compromise? I mean, I think it can be uh, <clears throat> both compressive and then um, I think the hard thing with these cases is that usually when I've done these OPLA cases, they typically do have a delayed, um, you know, they can get ischemia to the cord and, and things like that. Do you think that was a factor at all? For sure. I mean, we dealt yeah. with a compromised spinal cord. She had an incomplete spinal cord injury. I think I yeah. labeled her when I saw her first as an Asia C. Mm -hmm. And uh, she made a recovery clearly to an Asia D. And then she, again, this is a vulnerable cord. Anything that changes the perfusion dynamics mm -hmm. is bad for her. And to credit to her, she was so in tune with her physiology, yeah. she realized that there was something sour. Yeah. And she was thin also, so we could identify this. Mm -hmm. I think, and the second time, what did I do the second time to make it not uh, blow up again? I used fat graft, I think. Yeah, the second so time. again, is extensive repair and grafting and then decompression. Yeah. yeah. I sewed in fat graft laterally, that's what I remember. And yeah. did it work? Uh, yes, and she's she's done well since. I think she has a uh, weaker uh, left foot uh, as compared to her contralateral side. Um, I did look up a couple different articles in addressing the uh, graft and the uh, pseudomeningocele. Um, this is an interesting rabbit study uh, in New Zealand. Um, they created a mesh containment device for this graft and there was a greater volume of spine fusion noted in these rabbits uh, post-mortem. Um, but they also note there perhaps is an increased inflammation with clumps of the graft itself, which would make sense. And does this actually contribute to the spinal cord being affected? Um, it's hard to say. And again, this is animal model. Um, but it does address the, that uh, inflammation repair remodeling um, uh, issue with the, with the grafting and around the spinal cord itself. Um, the next uh, article is that the um, pseudomeningocele itself can be early or even late. Um, and so uh, they've got cases of even a couple years after surgery having a compressive pseudomeningocele and developing uh, myelopathic symptoms. So uh, something to, to keep in mind. So Avi, to you now, our featured speaker. Um, we talked a lot about surgical stuff, but the point in this case is we were desperately trying to get scarring around the dural space to get the CSF space to congeal. And uh, you're going to tell us that um, scarring around the epidural space is bad and can generate pain. Now we're talking about a cord level here, but you can see how desperate we were. We literally had to take this patient. I took this patient back to the OR twice. Uh, once, I think, uh, almost in the middle of the night and the second yeah, time in, in the wee morning hours because we were so, and this patient was so anxious. So. And then we found out, which is something, something we all know, that bone graft can create inflammation outside of, as this case shows, a mechanical compressive effect. So what are your thoughts as you hear all this kind of a surgical struggle to get scar to form and that we put inflammatory agents in close proximity to the neural elements? Do you just shudder or what are your thoughts? Well, this is certainly an interesting case. I would say I think it was handled beautifully. It's an unusual case. And when we look at costs and benefits of procedures, we always have to weigh what's most important. I'd say that maybe there's a potential for her to have residual pain from a thoracic radiculopathy down the line on account of the inflammation and fibrosis that was created in the epidural space, but that certainly outweighs motor deficits and remaining or having a worsening spinal cord injury, as well as recurrent spinal headaches from a persistent CSF leak. So I think in the balance, she's much better off. You're great. So, yeah. So, uh, Roxana Chiolka, thank you for your comment indeed. Um, uh, uh, so, this is uh, again an important thing to remember that bone graft can cause inflammation outside of a mechanical compression effect. Right. Thank you, Jimmy. All right. And next, we have Dr. Jared Cook. And uh, actually, Professor Young Hyde told us that he's actually uh, in the East Coast right now visiting family. So, good to have you on the same continental shelf. And we very much hope to have you here as a live visitor for one of our courses, Professor Young Hai. So, Jerry's yeah, going to take us into a little bit of different um, 
perspective. A little different direction. But st still, the epidural space is the main topic today, and pain and neurologic dysfunction caused in there. And we're getting out of the cord into the Cataquina territory, right, Jared? Yep. Just going to play it from the drive. All right, I'm going to start me on slide two. Awesome. Well, anyway, I'm uh, Jared Cook. I'm uh, one of the orthopedic spine fellows here. So we have a case of uh, a patient when they when they presented. Uh, they're 80 years old, um, had low back pain, um, bilateral anterior and lateral thigh pain, uh, you know, worse when rising from seated, about a five-minute walking tolerance, uh, kind of a claudication picture. Um, used uh, oxycodone for pain, um, history of prostate cancer that was treated with radical prostatectomy and, uh, and medically, so, and uh, uh, recent PSA was zero. Um, uh, but because of a long-term steroid use during, uh, during that, uh, it was osteoporotic. Um, so uh, we have their uh, DEXA scan up there showing the osteoporosis and then um, uh, some uh, neuro deficit. I made that a little bit uh, too small, but uh, essentially uh, some lower extremity weakness uh, bilaterally. And so initially, here's what happened. This is prior to presentation. Um, so uh, he presented uh, to an outside facility with an uh, L2 compression fracture. Uh, um, didn't get any better. MRI showed uh, L1 and L2 were both involved. And so that was treated with um, uh, vertebroplasty of both. And so what you see on that left image is after the first vertebroplasty, what you see on the right image is further collapse of L2. And then to the right of that is putting more cement into that cemented vertebra. Um, so uh, then the patient uh, has kind of more further collapse. And this is when uh, he you know presents uh, here. So at this point, um, uh, you know, at this point, patients, you know, still, you know, still having pain, um, having those symptoms that, uh, you know, that I mentioned before, and uh, sent for a bone scan. Wait, so let's go back for a second, just show us. So, um, one level burst factor, pretty badly osteoporotic patient. He's not a candidate for anabolic agents like teriparatites. Uh, because he has had a cancer history in, uh, in our uh, area here. Uh, our endocrine doctors are very reluctant to put those medications in. Um, Dr. Chavd, I'll go to you first. Any complaints about a doctor trying to do a vertebroplasty slash kyphoplasty early in this setting? Not that I'm aware of. I think that if the patient's just pain justifies it, it's an appropriate first step as long as it's done appropriately. And of course, in, as an interventionalist without surgical training, my biggest fear is during a burst fracture to ensure that there's no retropulsion of any fragments before performing something like this. But yeah. I, I would have done the same. And Professor Yong Hai, any concerns about doing an early kyphoplasty or I'll just call it cement augmentation? Uh, no, actually, uh, for this kind of a patient, we will choose to do the same uh, procedure and then ease the pain also. It, it kind of stabilizes the spine and prevent the, the further collapse of that. Yeah. Thank you. That was a big change for us also here in our region. We have a frequent contributor, Neil Schonert. He's in private practice. He did an amazing large scale registry study. He showed that this is effective and helps people from collapsing further. And uh, he actually got the reimbursement single-handedly through his registry changed by our government in our area. So uh, that's a pretty impressive uh, show of a private practice colleague changing reimbursement and treatment. So no complaints here. And again, if at all, the criticism is that maybe there was maybe too much of a delay. How much was, was the delay of the fracture to when the cement was put in? Um, uh, I think it was about three months. Yeah, so if at all, these patients should probably be cemented in the first three weeks and not later, because as we see here, that uh, L2 fracture has collapsed. Uh, Rod, do you send your patients uh, for early cement augmentation? I do. I think um, in the last, you know, 10 years, my uh, practice paradigm has evolved. And I think, you know, with all the new devices and cement and being able to do this as an outpatient, I do it more for deformity uh, and um, less for pain, but I think it works great for both. Yeah, and uh, we have uh, the great uh, pleasure of having a phenomenal interventionalist team here with uh, uh, Dr. Glenn David, 
and one of his fellows is here with us today. And Doug Beal frequently teaches us here. So we actually usually have our interventionists do this very early. And we try to see the call patients very early, so within the first three weeks, to make a surgical determination. But what happened next? All right. So patient was sent for the following imaging. Um, so uh, now we're actually going to see some, some more detail um, you know, on our images. So uh, here we see uh, you know, our CT scan, we see where the cement went. Um, and uh, then that uh, the axial image on the bottom, uh, that's, that's showing that uh, uh, retropulse fragment at L2. Um, and then, so you can see the canal diameter, and then the, uh, the one above that is that uh, up at L1. Um, you know, it looks like there's actually even further collapse of the uh, L2 vertebra, you know, from, uh, from prior. Um, here's what, you know, here's what we see at, uh, at the L2 level on MRI, uh, correlating with the patient's, you know, claudication symptoms. And then um, on, the, um, uh, on the bone scan, uh, we see that there is uh, increased uptake in the bilateral L2 pedicles. Um, so at this point, We've got central canal stenosis at L2 secondary to collapse um, and uh, neurogenic claudication secondary to same. Um, so what happens next? So Avi, uh, can you go back to the CT scan? There was, what happened is exactly uh, predictable almost. I mean, this was a noteworthy effort by a colleague. This is not done on our service here. Um, uh, to try to stabilize the spine. It was probably done a little bit late in the game, and this is again a emerging major problem for all healthcare systems to get these patients cemented early on without overusing this technique. And the patient now has severe radicular pain. There's some cement leakage into a foramen. Uh, Jared, did he ever have uh, uh, segmental injections or uh, like transferamental injections, nerve root blocks, anything? Uh, he did to try to uh, to try to alleviate the pain. Uh, it was very temporary. Um, you know, worked in the initial day. Yeah. Uh, kind of that story. So here we have some epidural compromise, perhaps from some cement. Um, this is a go-getter 80-year-old. He's a very successful businessman, emphasis on very, and also along with that, a very determined person. So he will not take no for an answer. Um, and he wants to keep on doing whatever he's doing. So what suggestions do you have now? We have epidural compromise, there's stenosis, um, any further, he's had some segmental blocks. I can't recall what exactly. Sometimes helpful, sometimes not. Any thoughts? Is this just a major uh, neural compression now? Should we hunt down roots uh, as a pain generator, or is this just a mechanical problem? I would certainly consider, as with foraminal extension of the contract or the cement, considering a selective nerve root block, maybe at L2, if that's consistent with his pain dermatome. If he doesn't have neurologic compromise and he's not having any weakness after a selective nerve root block. If it's just for pain control, you could consider a pulsed radiofrequency ablation of the DRG at that same level, just to give him some extra relief without having to resort to surgery, like a foraminotomy. Okay. Yeah, he's had a couple of injections. Again, he is not in our city here, he came from an outside city. And uh, there were a number of people because nobody wanted to really operate on him. Uh, and again, for us as surgeons, trying to remove cement from a nerve root is pretty frustrating because uh, I don't know, I've done it and I've spilled cement. And if you have a late uh, um, cement uh, root uh, visualization, it's not very happy situation to take care of. Uh, Professor Young, hi, what would you say now? Is there a reason for surgery? Should we decompress this patient? Uh, the spine may be stable, but you saw in the bone scan that there's a non-union also between the remnants of the vertebral body and the pedicles at L2. So there's a bit of mechanical instability there. Any thoughts? Any wisdom? Uh, I think I, I would I would consider uh, a minimally invasive uh, pilot school fixation percutaneously and two level and the two level be below and do a local just L2 decompression of the lamina to see if we can, even the foramen open up to see uh, if we can relieve the symptom. But uh, the uh, unstable and the first uh, collapse, the potential are still exists because we can see the class of the L2 and also the uh, pedicle. So I will do that. And even when I put in pilot school, I will do some cement augmentation of the level. So 
that that's about what I'm thinking to do. My partner, Dr. Hart, is here. So, Dr. Hart, this is obviously an extremely frustrating situation. The patient is a very demanding, very controlling individual, um, and he's extremely unhappy. He has a mixture, I would say, of neurogenic claudication, as uh, Jared pointed out, and radicular pain. He's had some. He's had a lot of needle things put in, and I'm not sure what all, but nothing really to his satisfaction. So, any words of wisdom? Should we intervene surgically now, or uh, should we just wait and see? Well, uh, you know, I, I think uh, there's there's no harm in waiting. I, 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 this sounds like a very elective uh, situation. I, I'm not hearing any red flags that would dictate urgent surgery. Um, I'm I'm not a hundred percent certain that the cement is really, at least on the images I'm seeing, that the cement is the cause of his uh, neurogenic claudication. He's got some stenosis from this fracture. Um, I. I uh, have done in a number of situations uh, acutely uh, uh, a uh, laminectomy with kyphoplasty for osteoporotic burst fractures. And I think uh, this is still an unsolved clinical problem. I mean, it's, it's a hard one to treat with our traditional instrumentation. I think, you know, it's prone to failure. I mean, the bone quality issues that led to this fracture uh, are at play and uh, instrumentation, I think, is... is uh, uh, you know, it, it is just uh, prone to adjacent segment or uh, or instrumented segment uh, failure. So um, I'd be thinking about just a laminectomy for this gentleman if we were going to intervene surgically. Uh, uh, I think now that he's stable, uh, that might be a sufficient treatment. All right. So, Jared, I saw the patient. What did I recommend? Um, so... Our recommendations, well, so the patient was very resistant to uh, the idea of surgery, so a, a you know, small option um, with uh, laminotomies and um, uh, interspinous spacers uh, was, uh, was offered, but really the recommendation was uh, laminectomy infusion, uh, T12 to L3, um, you know, going to, uh, going to L1 with, uh, with that cement wasn't uh, the greatest option, so um, going above that um, just kind of uh, was the recommendation. So my, my first option was uh, to actually fuse them very analogous to what uh, Professor Yong Hai said. The patient was unhappy with this, and again, this is an active businessman at age 80, and uh, Bob, he's very demanding. Yeah. And so I recommended to doing a decompression and actually taking out that upper end plate um, of L2 and doing posterior stabilization surgery, which is an off-label device with an interspinous spacer to keep him somewhat intact. I don't like to do a laminectomy setting. So what happened to the patient? So the patient uh, elected to receive treatment elsewhere. Um, so ended up getting a uh, full laminectomy um, of L1 to L3. And then within six days, he shows up with recurrence of symptoms. Um, uh, actually ended up with an epidural hematoma. Um, and uh, so then that was uh, washed out. So he shows up seven months after that, really uh, you know, much of the same symptoms. And the DEX is up there just as a reminder. That's the same DEXA from before. Um, so this this was his, you know, nice, uh, you know, a uh, couple days post-op complication. Here's, uh, you know, after that got washed out, and then he returns to the office um, uh, at this point, and this is what we see, um, you know, on on his new imaging after, you know, that laminectomy was done. Um, he's got about 13 degrees of extra kyphosis that he didn't have before. Um, so you can see that uh, kyphosis that. Uh, you know, is now occurring between uh, L1 and L2. L2 looks like it may have even collapsed a little bit more. Um, uh, at this point, his you know, SVA is 15. He's not happy. So he has kyphosis now. He has way worse pain. He had a decompression done just like what Dr. Hart suggested, which I think, I mean, I can't say that my concept of a decompression and post stabilization would have prevented this. I'm not making any such claims, but he now had a full laminectomy, and we can see the significant foraminal compromise now in this patient. And basically, when he gets up, he tilts forward. So this is, he's now extremely unhappy. Avi, any further thoughts? I mean, this, this patient is in a brace now. He's walking, uh, barely walking, and again, uh, this is a go-getter. So any thoughts? Can you go back to the MRI? Yep. Centrally is good. 
That's about it. Central decompression has been achieved. Any foraminal work to be done now? Any chance for an epidural lysis or anything like that? It's tough to say whether an epidural lysis really help. If we think at all that this could be from extravasation of cement, uh, lysis will not help to dissolve that. I would almost suggest at this point, a spinal cord stimulator, if it's strictly for pain control, might be an option. But it also depends on if this is primarily in an L2 distribution, where the cement is relative to the DRG. If it's proximal, then spinal cord stimulation might be the best option. If it looks like it's around the DRG or anywhere or distal at the foraminal level, then uh, pulsed radio frequency of the DRG is still an option. Jared, show your cursor to the left sagittal image, that white seam in that cement area. Go left, left, left. Yeah, this is for me a typical air sign. So basically the patients, when they're laying down, they gap open. When they stand up, this just collapses. So this is a, you see this also with Camel's disease, so avascular necrosis, but this is a, a fake signal. This is more or less a fluid filled uh, space. A rod, word of wisdom here. So the laminectomy was tried. Uh, disaster with an epidural hematoma. He developed a deficit. He's recovered. He now has mechanical pain and way worse back and leg pain. He can't walk and he's generally very unhappy and assume this is a very controlling person. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, I think, poor bone quality. Um, you know, a lot of factors play, played into this. And I mean, these are not, these are very difficult cases to manage. I think um, potentially doing a uh, stabilization procedure in the front, I think probably would have helped a little bit, but who knows? All right, let's move forward. Yeah, so I mean, you know, maybe at the time he's got deformity now, so that really does change, uh, you know, change what his options are. Um, so the uh, proposed procedure was a, a revision decompression fusion uh, G12 to L3 uh, with cemented screws because it was osteoporosis, um, uh, an L2 corpectomy uh, because of that collapse. Then uh, inner body fusion. Uh, well, that's you know goes with the corpectomy, um, and then uh, vertebroplasty, UIV plus one and UIV or uh, LIV minus one. Um, and so, you know, here is uh, you know the end result uh, of that. And then for comparison, you know where he started versus you know where he is now, uh, significantly straighter. Um, he's actually. Doing pretty well. Um, dispo to uh, to you know sniff about a week after surgery. Um, you know pain uh, consistently decreasing, mobility increasing. Um, he's happy with his result. So can you go back one? So Rod, you want to critique me? So I did dual cages on him because we uh, untethered his nerve roots, which are completely scarred. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we did a epidural lysis on him surgically. Avi, don't shudder. Um, uh, we didn't put any magic gels on. We basically stabilized them on the back. Exactly what Professor Yong Hai said. We used cement above, below, and cemented the screw tracks. We drilled through the cement uh, on the level above. Uh, this is why we went two above. Otherwise, I would have done the, with this one above, one below. Is this going to work? Is this bound to fail? What's happening? I mean, I think this is one of the reasons why I started doing a lot of lateral surgery. Um, I think this is a potentially you could have um, just stabilized, decompressed, and then, you know, come back later and, and try to do, do something that provides some anterior column support. But, um, you know, these are very difficult cases because you can see the bone quality is not great. And you gotta, I think just going in from the back, you know, if you do multi-levels, it's, there's a high chance of failure in, in, um, in a case like this. And you can start to see there's some, subsidence already of the cages. That happened right in surgery. Yeah. Dr. David is here. Can you pass the microphone over to Glenn? So I've put in bilateral uh, cement augmentation, and I see that you're very elegant with doing uni uh, pedicular cement uh, applications into the virtual bodies. Is there a benefit in doing bilateral ones like what I do, or should I learn how, to, how you cross over the midline and get kind of a fill from your unilateral approaches? Sorry, uh, Jens, I was coming into this. So I'm putting bilateral, this is a technical question. Oh, so uh, this is vertebral plasty or is this yeah, carpal plasty? plasty? This is a vertebral plasty, simply okay. augmentation above and below. I come from both sides to get kind of a fill under the end plate, but I've seen you with your kind of special needles go from a unilateral portal and fill the entire vertebral body. Uh, what do you do? And this is better than doing bilateral ones. Well, uh, I usually base it upon the fracture itself. 
as you know, uh, Jens, I do prefer using kyphoplasty over vertebroplasty itself. Uh, I'm creating a cavity. Uh, there are other devices that can be used to create a cavity uh, in a kyphoplasty type of scenario, whereas vertebroplasty, as we know, uh, we're uh, employing a needle and then injecting cement. Uh, with kyphoplasty, we are using a balloon or another device to uh, create a cavity into the bone and then employing the cement. It provides an area for us to, uh, for the cement to go to and less uh, extravasation and backfill of the actual cement. So uh, in terms of the actual uh, unipedicular approach versus uh, biparticular, uh, it depends on the, on the actual fracture. If you're able to get across uh, into the uh, center uh, and uh, distal portion of the uh, vertebral body, uh, then you'll be able to employ a balloon or a, another cavity creating device to uh, uh, get the cement distal, uh, more distally and create a nice uh, fill of the uh, deal body. Uh, so I'm able to get that with a unibricular approach. Um, uh, uh, but you can do the same thing with a biparticular approach for kyphoplasty. And Professor Young, hi. Sadly, the images were taken down already. We're preparing the next case. But um, what are your thoughts about the construct that I made? Would you have gone from far lateral, like what Dr. Oskuyan said, to not have to put in two cages? Because again, the roots are very scarred down. Any critique on my case as you remember it? We can maybe, do you know how to pull it up again, or is that gone? I think it's gone. It's gone. It's gone. So, uh, Professor, uh, I, I, I still remember the, the image, and uh, I think uh, you you done a really great job, and I would do the same. The only thing different is uh, uh, I may not be able or want to put a a, a vertebral body in front because it it, it looks like it, there's a, a concentrated force on the on the a contact area so it was causing subsidence i will consider to do a, a total facet cut me to open up the foramen and probably just shortening the the space and then clean out the space in the l1 tool and put some even some just the regular lumbar spine cages or even bigger t lift cages in between and then some bone grafting and make sure it, it heals, it fused on, at that level. And because uh, I would do that because when the last time the patient came in, you look at the x-ray, it already has sagittal imbalance and the local kyphosis already happened. You you needed to do something about that. And still, the patient still have some little bit uh, uh, sagittal imbalance uh, forward. I'm just afraid of the uh, the DJK or the distal problem will come back maybe sooner or later. Thank you. Well spoken. He's over three months out now. I had him in a brace. I've just taken him out of the brace. We're starting posterior muscle exercises. His neurologic symptoms have actually stopped. Uh, pretty much he's quite happy with that. Uh, but I completely agree with you. I'm not out of my worry phase on this patient. So uh, I would not be uh, surprised if he falls apart somewhere and then needs a whatever mega surgery, but uh, he actually did surprisingly well. Another case, Dr. Chris Seidel has another case to show and another angle of concern about the dural space. All right. So this is a 55 year old male. He came in complaining of bilateral pelvic pain, buttock pain and leg pain radiating down both legs to the calves. Um, at the time he denied any trauma recently, further questioning, he said two weeks ago, he was in an MVC uh, and then his, pan, his pain began about 10 days ago. So there's a little bit of a gap between the MVC and when his symptoms began. Uh, when he presented, inflammatory markers were the normal limits. He was afebrile, no bowel or bladder dysfunction, no saddle uh, paresthesias. Um, his past medical history is significant for uh, relapsing and remitting and multiple sclerosis uh, that was being treated. Uh, on exam, he has some right dorsiflexion weakness, but that had been present for 18 plus years and he attributed it to his MS. Otherwise, there was no focal neurologic deficits, just pain. Uh, we didn't have any uh, standing, uh, we didn't have any plain x-rays, rather, just MRI that was obtained in the ED. I'm going to let this scroll through. So you can see here on the left at L45, there's a collection, uh, a dense collection. At the time, the radiologist felt, based on imaging alone, he could call this septic arthritis of the left L45 facet joint. 
uh, with an epidural abscess and severe cal canal stenosis. Um, so based on that radiology report, he was admitted by the hospitalist, got a infectious disease consult, started on broad spectrum antibiotics, and we were consulted for uh, operative management. So based on that, we indicated him for uh, L45 laminectomy with evacuation of that epidural mass. And what we found during the surgery was that the, it was actually just an organized blood clot. And then under the microscope, it was found to be quite adherent to uh, the dura and the ligamentum. Um, so we had a tough time actually getting it teased off because it had been there so long. You know, as, as you know, at blood anywhere where it's not supposed to be causes inflammatory reaction and that caused a little bit of fibrosis there. Uh, on follow-up, he is two months out now, doing well overall, pain significantly improved, uh, ability to ambulate significantly improved due to a decrease in pain. So definitely on the mend. Um, I did find an interesting case study uh, where they were looking at delayed traumatic epidural hematomas with neurologic deficits, uh, which is similar to, to what we found. Uh, and in their uh, presentation here, they had a progressive neurologic deficit. It was in a, a cervical thoracic junction, um, but similar kind of presentation other than he, this patient had complete paralysis below T1. Uh, they took him to surgery, evacuated it, and he made a complete recovery. So these can do quite well if you get to them early and decompress. Um, but it's a relatively rare uh, injury, less than 2% of spinal injuries, uh, and typically more common in patients who have pre-existing vascular anomalies or uh, coagulopathies. So can you go back to the MRI image? So this is a very unusual case. And again, I had one not too long ago uh, with an intradural hematoma, actually, which we didn't know what it was. Um, so why did this happen? Rod, was this your case? Yeah, this was my case. So was it instability or was that medication in this MS patient a problem? If you stop, if you go yeah. up again, or stop it right here with a facet fluid sign. So I'm seeing a facet fluid sign. Was instability the problem? No, uh -uh. I mean, this was traumatic. Yeah. This is the only way that this can happen. So, you know, I've seen it like a bike accident. I mean, it doesn't take much. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, everyone was sort of, oh, you know, and in fact, even in the beginning, I was a little bit suspicious because he really didn't have, he had more, you know, didn't look septic, didn't look like he had an infection. Mm -hmm. Um, but just given the size and location of it, you don't know, you know, could be a tumor, could be, I've seen, you know, lymphoma, myeloma behave this way. So um, just given the compressive effects, you know, we thought um, going in and it's such a small surgery and the guy got better right away. Yeah. But at this level with the coincidence, I hate to be argumentative of yeah. the facet joints, that facet fluid sign, isn't instability a potential co uh, cause? I mean, I think potentially, but given the imaging features, I mean, that didn't look like a facet cyst or anything like mm -hmm. that, you know? So it was, I mean, you can see it on the axial. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, and, the, and it's hard to see on this, but when you window it and you look at it, you can actually, um, you know, look at it. It does look like an organized mass. Yeah. So... So you thought right from the beginning, this is not an epidural, uh, this is not an epidural abscess, this is more a other lesion? No, I mean, I, th I, th I thought for sure it's, it's either abscess, tumor, less likely hematoma. In fact, we talked about it. Yeah. And what so, tumor would you consider? Myeloma. Hmm. Professor young -Hai, have you ever seen a spontaneous hematoma in the epidural space? Uh, no, no, I haven't seen this. Kind of, this is it's a very interesting case. Yes, I'm glad the um, ER doctor, Scott, uh, he, and this was several days later after an injury, right? Yeah, two weeks ago was two the MBC, weeks. and then 10 days uh, prior to presentation was when yeah. the symptoms started. So there was a, about a four-day lag between the trauma and when symptoms began. So it was probably having a small venous ooze the whole time that just finally got compressive enough to cause And symptoms. that MS medication, does that have a anti It's immunosuppressive, effect? but it has no anticoagulation effects. Okay. Dr. Chavda, so here we have a spontaneous epidural hematoma. As far as we know, no medicational causes. Uh, any thoughts on why this gets worse rather than resorbing? I mean, you, you do have epidural hematomas. We all face that around every surgery. Um, when should they start resorbing and uh, when do you start getting imaging? 
I would get imaging immediately after a suspicion of any kind of compressive etiology after a trauma like this. I saw a really similar case that I reported on at the World Institute of Pain Conference when I was in fellowship at Hopkins. It was about four days after we did a cervical interlaminar. Patient had complete resolution of their pain and came back to the clinic. Then leaving the clinic had a MVC that totaled her car with a whiplash injury had no deficits, presented almost a week later in our routine follow-up from clinic and had a large epidural hematoma at that level. And of course, our fear was that maybe our inner laminar had a role in it, but uh, it didn't look like it. But you can have a slow venous plexus leak as a venous a vein in the epidural space that can very slowly ooze, like was mentioned, and you can have a delayed onset of a hematoma. And I would, I would get routine imaging. I think it would probably start to absorb around the four to six week mark. Yeah. We might want to think about if you have some nice imaging with flexion extension films afterwards to uh, put this as a uh, into one of those case report journals just to have the images out there because yeah. I think this is pretty unusual also. It is kind of unusual. Great. Last case uh, before our uh, honorary lecturer, Dr. Avi Chavda, will speak. Dr. Mauricio uh, Avila, and he's going to talk about um, a different form of dural challenge. Okay. Good morning. Uh, this is a 48-year-old male <clears throat> who was referred to our spine clinic uh, for uh, thoracic back pain radiating anteriorly to his chest. Uh, just to cut to the point, he has a uh, relevant history of non-small cell lung cancer that was treated with chemotherapy and radiation four months prior to the presentation of the spine clinic. Um, in our initial examination during the first clinic appointment, he was basically neurologically intact. His main issue was the back pain. Um, I went back to his original images, so you can see just a chest x-ray. He presented with cough and an, an ER uh, facility, and then they did that. And the time of diagnosis, the middle CT, um, I think is relevant just as a retrospect, uh, but you can see the quite large uh, right side um, long mass, which already had initial infiltration into the vertebral body. Um, he underwent uh, bronch bronchoscopy uh, and biopsies uh, for his diagnosis and then underwent radiation. And you can see that the, the CT on the um, right-hand side is the post-radiation CT. Um, up to this point, uh, we're basically unaware of this patient. By the time he comes to our first um, clinic visit, this is the, his new CT. You can see the progression of, and the infiltration on the CAT scan, both on the axle and, and the sagittal. And that's the MRI wood contrast that was uh, obtained. You can see there's, a, again, a large tumor in the vertebral body infiltrating into the epidural space. You can see there's on the sagittal MRI, there's at least two vertebral bodies involved with, uh, I will say, quite extensive epidural disease causing um, spinal cord uh, stenosis, canal stenosis with some spinal cord compression. Luckily for him at this point, he is not, he has no neurological deficits. So given the, um, go ahead, I'm gonna go ahead. So given the uh, tumor infiltration, his back pain, and, and the concerns for a potential a spinal cord compression, he underwent a two-level corpectomy and uh, posterior fixation. The, the final diagnosis of the tissue was um, metastatic uh, small cell tumor. This was his first surgery. So, <clears throat> excuse me, he did quite well post-op. His pain was greatly improved. He went back to almost his normal activities. He was enjoying his life with his family, going back to bicycle. He went down on his pain medications. But about a month prior to the, our, clinic, our new clinic visit, he started developing more severe back pain. And um, he actually went to see a, uh, his oncologist and then a pain doctor who recommended an, an intrathecal pain pump for a cancer-related pain. He underwent that and then eventually made it back to our clinic because he was starting developing a lower extremity weakness. He was ha having trouble walking and, um, and was basically now bedridden because of pain and his trouble walking. On exam at that time on, on a new clinic visit, he was three out of five. The sensation was preserved, and he had no bowel bladder symptoms, but quite weak. Um, so at this time, this is his new MRI that we order, and you can see there is, I will call this recurrence of that tumor. You can see the, the shadow of the cage of the carpectomy size and, and tumor now, again, invading the canal. And those two axle cuts you can see on the top one. Let me put a pointer. 
There is still a little bit of CSF and cord, but then I know there's some screws, but then basically the cord disappears on the lower level because of this new trimmer occurrence. So given, again, his progressive back pain, but most more importantly, his uh, progressive neurological symptoms, and now with uh, bilateral extremity weakness, we recommended uh, an urgent admission from the, from the clinic and a new resection of, of the tumor. Just of note, I put it there, at this point, he has had chemotherapy and actually two cycles of radiation. One, the first when he got diagnosis and then he got um, stereotactic radio surgery on after the corpectomy. So, and of course the IT pain pump. So during this resection, which I think it's, it's the relevant part for the today's discussion, it was quite severe scarring, um, both from his surgery and of course from the two cycles of radiation, which uh, made finding the, the tissue planes quite challenging, but uh, we were able to resect the tumor from, um, from the uh, fundura as, as much as we could. Of course, not achieving a complete resection, but good enough for, for decompression. After that second surgery, his bilateral extremity um, weakness improved to four out of five. However, the, his main issue remained uh, pain management. Of course, at, at this point, the patient also has uh, additional lung nodules and, and, um, and his uh, cancer pain. Um, he was discharged to a rehab facility and oncology is waiting for his possible eligibility for additional oncological care as he's now on, I think he's gonna be on his third or fourth cycle of chemotherapy. Um, so uh, personally for me, the, the case, the learning process for this case was the involvement the spine team early. As you saw in that first CT at the time of diagnosis, it was already a uh, tumor infiltrating the vertebral body. Um, I think here, again, looking back, the placement of the IT pain pump before getting a new MRI that showed the recurrent tumor, it's, I will say, a question mark. I don't know if they would, I don't think it would change much of what we had done, but maybe the time. Um, and from a surgical perspective and a technical perspective, the, the scarring from the radiation plus, of course, the prior surgery, making, making our surgery more challenging. In this case, what we did is we went lateral to the cord first and worked lateral to medial, uh, leaving the, what we call the, um, the high real estate area for the, la for the last part, which is everything against the cord, um, to try to create some new planes. And less is more in, in some of this epidural recurrent tumors. And in the first surgery, there was a proper separation surgery done from both sides? Yes. Okay. Yes. It was bilateral takedown of the, of the nerve roots and complete removal of the tumor. So there was a proper separation mm -hmm. surgery definition fulfilled. Right. So at least uh, one inch or something like that. So two centimeters, roughly separation of tumor. I, I wasn't in that surgery, tumor. but uh, yes, that's what the, it was, it was described for that first surgery. Yes. Um, so I did the surgery and this is a difficult um, case because, you that's know, right. um, if you look at the original um, MRI and CT scan that uh, unfortunately there's, you know, the ribs, multiple, you know, three or four ribs were involved the chest walls infiltrated, you know, there's no way you're going to get an on block resection of something like this. So we did a very clean, there was a very nice, you know, separation surgery performed. He had radiation, um, got chemotherapy. Unfortunately, this is one of those cases where, you know, I think lung cancer patients um, tend to progress pretty quickly. And, um, and uh, he got standard radiation, he got stereotactic radio surgery and still um, had recurrent tumor and fairly rapidly. Um, and I think, you know, again, um, these cases are challenging and um, usually actually they do pretty well, but you do have, I thought this was an excellent um, uh, case where, you know, you can demonstrate, I mean, you get failures from radiation and surgery and this is one of them. So, uh, Dr. Chavda, in these kind of uh, oncologic cases, I don't know whether you deal with those. Uh, obviously, there was this comment made about IT pumps, but should we put some anti-scarring membrane in this that if we have to go back again, we have an easier dissection plane, or would this be absolutely contraindicated? I think it would be contraindicated most likely, certainly when we look at doing a lysis of adhesions because of the volumes that we use. Any Anytime there's 
of prior compressive etiology or possibility for ongoing compression, we would avoid doing a lysis specifically because uh, we use such large volumes that we can create uh, further compression. Separately, if there's a risk of dural tear from dural involvement, then we can a subarachnoid injection is, um, of course, a contraindication as well. Professor Yonghai, final comments on this case. Any words of wisdom from your end? Uh, I think in the case, uh, the whole series treatment is uh, very successful, and uh, we would done the same. And uh, uh, for the um, uh, separation surgery, we we turn to do it's more adequate to even get the. Uh, uh, for example, this one, we would probably take out the whole two vertebral body, including the disc and the, the posterior construct. We will do uh, uh, probably uh, 3D printing the um, vertebral body uh, construct anteriorly and then uh, get the good support. So uh, that's that's my comment. Thank you. No, thank you. So thank you all for the discussions and our uh, uh, great fellows uh, for showing these cases. Uh, appreciate all these things. It's a great honor to have Dr. Avi Chavda here for the first time and introduce him to our community. And by the way, shout out to Dr. Robert Huang in Arizona. He just saw his uh, resident uh, perform and I hope it's to your satisfaction. He's a great colleague. Uh, Dr. Chavda trained at Johns Hopkins in interventional spine pain management. And I'm very conflicted, as I said in the intro, he's from Dallas, Texas and attended St. Mark's School. And he does residency at UT Southwestern, which is my old uh, stomping grounds and he's a very unique person, I um, must say. He is also an accomplished concert pianist, and he is a USA Memory Championship uh, uh, number two uh, uh, completer, so he uh, is a memory uh, wizard, and he also lifts weights and wrestles, so uh, a all-around talent. But here we're today to talk about uh, the epidural space as a pain generator, and uh, it's very important for us to have interdisciplinary communications about how the epidural space may contribute to pain because we do surgery and surgery leads to scar. So when does scar, when does the epidural space become a pain generator? Thank you, Dr. Chavda, for joining us this morning. Thank you very much, Dr. Chapman. I'm gonna share my slides here in a moment. Okay, can everybody see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you again for the wonderful introduction. It is my pleasure to discuss a topic that's near and dear to me. It's epidural lysis of adhesions. Uh, a little bit of a expansion on the background. I also did a visiting fellowship under the great Dr. Doug Beal in Oklahoma City, who is well known to SSF. And I practice at Virtuoso Spine and Joint in Dallas, Texas, alongside my mentor, Dr. Gabor Rax, who helped to pioneer this procedure and many others. It is unfortunately not in the standard repertoire for most pain physicians, and I'm hoping to convince you why it should be. Brief list of disclosures. I am a consultant for Medtronic. It is not directly relevant to today's presentation. I will also try my best to refer as generically to the tools mentioned as possible. The vast majority of physicians performing this procedure do so with the devices made by a single company, but there are other companies making analogous devices that can also be used. During today's presentation, I'm gonna map where we're gonna go. We're gonna start with definitions of the procedure. Where we'll talk a little bit about the history of the procedure and the figures who shaped its evolution. We'll talk about indications, uh, again, the instruments that are used for it. We'll discuss very briefly access technique. We're going to focus on the lumbar and sacral spine. Of course, this procedure can be done in both the cervical and thoracic segments as well, but it's a little bit outside of the scope. And lecture format is really not the best for describing procedural technique in the first place, but I'll give a cursory overview. We'll talk about the various injectates. We'll talk about post-procedural care. I'll cover some of the studies supporting this procedure, and then we'll leave time for some questions. Key take-homes from this procedure, first and foremost to drive home is that patient selection is paramount. If you do this procedure on a patient who does not need it, they will not get better. And we need to ensure we're very, very picky about who we perform this on. Again, during the procedure, we should be extra careful about sedation. Most patients receive a moderate 
level of sedation, moderate sedation, to make them comfortable during the procedure. But it's important not to over sedate because patients should be able to communicate with us. And they should be able to move the affected limb during the procedure. Like mentioned during the panel discussion, very, very important to rule out any possibility of a subdural injection during the procedure. We'll talk about that. Physical therapy should follow immediately after the procedure, and it's key to ensuring prevention of additional scarring. And lastly, the history of medicine matters, and I'm going to highlight some of the wonderful individuals behind the discoveries that created this procedure. Epidural lysis of adhesions, unsurprisingly, is the mechanical and chemical disruption of existing adhesions in the epidural space. Most often, this is seen following surgical intervention, also after annular tears. There are many other causes, epidural hematomas, for example, pain that can be caused from adhesions following prior vertebral compression fractures as well. It is not always seen on even advanced imaging. CAT scans and MRIs generally have only about 50% sensitivity and 70% specificity. That increases, of course, using an MRI with contrast, but even inter-rater reliability decreases about six months after a prior surgery when trying to differentiate epidural scarring from a recurrent disc herniation, for example. Uh, epiduroscopy is a gold standard, and so is the performance of an epidurogram. There is emerging evidence that PET MRI is an excellent modality as well. On an epidurogram, we most often see light, uh, epidural adhesions as filling defects with injection of contrast. And most importantly, pain can be generated by the adhesion of multiple structures. Very often, we see adhesion of dura to the posterior longitudinal ligament, which is one of the most densely innervated structures in the central canal. But we can also see it along epiradicular structures, typically in the lateral recess, along the sleeves of nerve roots. The procedure over the years has gone by a variety of names and continues to be referred to variously as epidural adhesiolysis, epidural neurolysis, percutaneous neuroplasty, and my personal favorite, of course, the RAX procedure. The various elements of this procedure can be traced back to the start of the 20th century. I take particular interest in the lives behind these discoveries because it, it gives us context historically. The first epidural injection was performed in 1901 using cocaine to treat sciatica. This is performed by Jean Sicard, who is a French neurologist and radiologist. And we're unsure historically whether this was a kind of a calculus situation where Newton and Leibniz independently but simultaneously came to the same discovery of calculus or a Roger Bannister effect where one person did it and everybody else shortly followed. But almost at the exact same time, Catalan independently performed epidural injections with cocaine and so did Pasquier and Lery. Jean Sicard and his partner Jacques Forestier about 20 years later were the first to perform an epidurogram. This was in 1921, and this was done using a very early form of contrast called lipiodol. Lipiodol is derived from poppy seed oil, and Jean Sicard came to be known by many as the father of contrast radiology. He was a very interesting figure. In addition to this, he was one of the first to perform myelograms, and he was a pioneer in the use of pneumoencephalography, which of course was popularized by Walter Dandy along with ventriculography when he was at Johns Hopkins and was part of what laid the ground for the rift between him and his mentor, Harvey Cushing. And that rivalry, of course, in the surgical analysis is one of the greatest of all time, rivaled perhaps only by that between DeBakey and Cooley about 40 years later in Houston, Texas. But that was a little bit of the history of that. And then in Daniel Moore in 1950 was the first to use hyaluronidase in the epidural space, and he used it as, quote, a spreading factor. He reported over 1,500 cases of successful use of that. Hyaluronidase in particular is an enzyme. It cl cleaves glycosidic bonds, specifically hyaluronic acid, typically from connective tissues. It is shown to inhibit neutrophil activity and also enhances the permeability of connective tissue. That's based on a study, many studies, but one of the more recent ones by Franza in uh, 2014, 2016, sorry. Going forward, hypertonic saline was first injected in the subarachnoid space for intractable pain in 1967 and later used for osmolytic neurolysis of the trigeminal nerve to treat facial pain. And that was done by Edward Hitchcock. And all of that, of course, paved the way for the development of epidural lysis of adhesions, which was first reported in 1989, 1986, but first published in this book, the first edition of Techniques of Neurolysis by Dr. Gabor Rax. 
The procedure was awarded a CPT code by the AMA in year 2000. Those codes are 62263 for what's referred to as a multi-day lysis and 62264 for a one-day lysis of adhesions. Pictured here are some salient figures relevant to today's presentation. On the left is the aforementioned Dr. Edward Hitchcock. He was a British neurosurgeon born in 1929. He trained at Oxford and Manchester and was a longtime professor at the University of Birmingham. He was a pioneer in functional neurosurgery and was one of the first to use transplantation of uh, or neural transplantation specifically for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. And he was also a pioneer in the field of stereotactic techniques for brain biopsies and radio surgery. In the middle is Dr. Gabor Rax, born in Budapest in 1929. He was a second year medical student at Semmelweis University during the Hungarian Revolution of 1956. He had received a directive to reconnoiter a sugar truck for his medical school. And after that was found to be wanted by the Soviets for questioning, he figured rather than have them disappear him, he would disappear himself. And he absconded uh, by cover of darkness to Germany and then by way of boat to Liverpool, where he put himself through medical school, learning English as a waiter and uh, attended University of Liverpool, graduated and then did anesthesiology residency at Syracuse University, uh, sorry, in Syracuse at SUNY Upstate, and then became the longtime chair of anesthesiology at Texas Tech. On the right is William H. Sweet, a legendary neurosurgeon He was who uh, with whom I have a bit of a musical affinity. He was born in 1910 and graduated from high school at the age of 14. He then decided to pursue a life as a concert pianist, but shortly thereafter recognized that his the gap between what he needed to, where he needed to be talent wise and where he was was insurmountable and instead turned his attention toward a medical career. This struck a chord with me, pun intended, as I made a similar decision to relinquish dreams of becoming a concert pianist to instead pursue the surer path of medicine. Unfortunately, my similarity with Bill Sweet ends there. Bill Sweet went on to the University of Washington, where he graduated first in his class. From there, he went on to Harvard Medical School, won a Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford, and then returned stateside to complete a neurosurgery residency at the University of Chicago under Percival Bailey. Percival Bailey was a neurosurgeon who had a wildly colorful youth. He, like Walter Dandy before mentioned, was a, an assistant to Harvey Cushing, but many years later and at the Brigham after he had left Johns Hopkins and had similar differences of opinion with Harvey Cushing when he was there. But Bill Sweet eventually became the chair of neurosurgery at MassGen for about 16 years and is credited with being one of the first to apply radiofrequency ablation in the treatment of trigeminal neuralgia and separately for his uh, pioneering work with peripheral nerve simulators alongside Dr. Websick. So with that historical context and digression, we return to our procedure. Of course, indications are the most important aspect of determining how to do a procedure and when to do a procedure. We, in this presentation are focusing on lumbar and sacral adhesis, adhesions and lysis of those adhesions. So our focus is on low back pain. Most often, like I mentioned before, this is indicated for patients who've had post-laminectomy syndrome or ruptured discs. Uh, it can be for pain that's after a vertebral compression fracture or even from spinal mets. Typically patients have undergone all of the standard repertoire. They've tried epidurals, they've tried physical therapy. As, as before mentioned, often they've had surgery before. In many cases, they've already tried spinal cord stimulation, and yet they still have pain without a clear surgical target. And this is a great procedure for those patients. Again, they typically have impaired epidural flow of contrast during an epidurogram or epidural adhesion seen on advanced imaging. From a physical exam perspective, apart from all of the typical findings of a radiculopathy that may be present, they should have a positive dural tug, which is performed with a patient seated on a flat surface with legs outstretched. We typically have them lean forward until their pain is produced as if they were reaching for their toes. It should reproduce the pain in the same dermatome as their index pain. After that, we rapidly flex their head forward to tug on the dura and reproduce the pain or exacerbate that same pain. It's almost like a modification of a Brudzinski sign. If Newton had worn a white coat, he almost certainly would have had a law of medicine for every indication. There's an equal and opposite contraindication. And this is a list of some of the main contraindications for this procedure, particularly spinal instability, presence of a syrinx, 
of course, allergy to any of the injectates, which are numerous and which we'll discuss shortly, any kind of bleeding disorder, uh, any use of blood thinners or antiplatelet medications, active infection. This is a relative contraindication, but comorbidities that might prevent them from receiving moderate sedation safely and arachnoiditis, which is also a relative contraindication primarily based on the risk of us becoming subdural or getting subdural during the injection. Here are some of the instruments that we use. I've, I'm going to refer to them as generically as possible. On the left, we see a Cudet tip needle, and I'm going to use my laser pointer here. This is a TUI style needle with a curve at the end to allow for enhanced steerability. Typically, when we do this procedure, we use uh, a needle that has two stylets. As you can see here, the yellow capped stylet is the standard stylet that sits flush with the tip of the needle. This is what we use as we advance toward the spinal elements, of course, to prevent taking a core biopsy with an open needle. Then once we get closer to our target, we exchange that for this white cap stylet, which is what's referred to as an obturating stylet. As you can see here in this blown up image, this stylet extends about a millimeter beyond the tip of the needle, and that protects vital elements such as nerve roots and blood vessels from being sheared while we're rotating our needle tip. Also, you'll see that there's a little bit of a cutback at the distal tip on the convex side of the needle, and that also uh, prevents shearing of the catheter which as we advance it. On the right here, we see one such catheter. This is uh, typically a 21-gauge soft tip catheter. It's spring-tipped as well, Teflon-coated, usually stainless steel, and this allows us to advance this uh, catheter in the epidural space without injuring or uh, overtly traumatizing any of the major structures, particularly the epidural veins, preventing us from causing a epidural hematoma. It injects out the side ports, so it allows us to bluntly dissect as we're advancing this, usually with multiple passes in the epidural space. Uh, but by no means are you limited to the use of this catheter. Plenty of doctors have repurposed other catheters for this procedure, and particularly Italian Interventional radiologists have successfully used five French vascular catheters that are placed over a guide wire, and you can achieve the same effect. Anything that can mechanically and chemically disrupt with the injectates, the adhesions will serve the purpose. And lastly, we typically use a lure lock bacterial filter, especially for multi-day lysis of adhesions where we leave an indwelling catheter. The only caveat to this is when we inject particulate steroids, which is our steroid of choice, usually triamcinolone. Triamcinolone is a large enough particle that it will not make it through the bacterial filter, so that would need to be injected before applying the filter. So I'll very briefly go over access. Of course, this is better demonstrated in a cadaver lab, but most often we're starting the procedure with caudal access, very standard method of obtaining that is to place a finger over the sacral hiatus. You can roll over the sacral cornea. And then in an AP view on the fluoroscopy as seen here, you can advance your TUI needle through the sacral hiatus. Typically, you're starting contralateral to your target. If you know in advance, based on the patient's symptoms that you're going to be going on the right side, you would start your needle at the left gluteal mound, enter typically at the left aspect of the sacral hiatus and advance typically no more superior than S3 to avoid catching a low-lying dura and creating a dural tear. We advance to that on a lateral view. We typically have our needle tip facing ventrally, so we can target primarily the ventral epidural space. After that, we remove the stylet and we inject typically 10 cc's of non-ionic water-based contrast, usually iohexol, and that gives us a good map of where there might be defects due to epidural adhesions. Once you've mapped your defect, you would remove or you would actually place your catheter. Typically, we take our thumb and we bend the tip of the catheter approximately 15 degrees. It's the distal one inch of the catheter to enhance durability. Allows us to target where we need to be. Transforaminal access is occasionally also obtained. Usually that's if there's more than one level involved based on, again, the mapping and patient symptoms, or sometimes if the caudal Access is just not sufficient. Usually our catheter is between either two, you come in 12 inch lengths or 24 inch lengths. But if for some reason we don't feel confident that we can get to the adhesion through a caudal approach, sometimes we use a transforaminal approach as an adjunct to that. And especially we use the S1 foramen when we are uh, trying to reach the scarring triangle at L5 S1. So again, very standard transforaminal access, as you can see here on the left at S1, 
We typically put a little bit of a cranial tilt to line up the anterior and posterior foramina at S1. And then we advance starting our needle just lateral to the S2 foramen and then advance to the medial aspect of the S1 foramen. We pop through the transverse ligament, the, the foraminal ligaments, and then we, with, this is with our needle tip facing inferiorly. Then typically we restylet the needle with the obturating stylet before rotating at 180 degrees, as you can see here, to face the bevel superiorly. And then we'll typically toggle the hub of the needle inferiorly again to send the tip even further superior and we advance with the uh, uh, obturating stylet. Again, we would in inject contrast through there after removing the stylet, and then we would advance our catheter to our target. We also can do this in the lumbar spine, and sometimes we were trying to obtain lumbar transforaminal access. Typically, we're doing that with an infraneural approach through Camden's triangle. Very similar technique. You would advance your needle, usually after squaring the end plates and putting a little bit of ipsilateral oblique on the C-arm. You would typically advance the needle to the SAP, where my laser pointer is, with the needle bevel facing medially. At that point, you would restyle it with an obturating stylet, rotate 180 degrees lateral to walk off the SAP about five millimeters, and then again, rotate 180 degrees back into the uh, epidural space. You'll pop through the intertransverse ligament, then rotate 180 or sorry, 90 degrees so that your bevel tip is facing superiorly and you can guide the catheter up in the epidural space, targeting the ventral aspect of it. see here. I think my slides may be frozen. There we go. So we'll cover some of the injectates. Of course, there's, this is a well-studied algorithm for injectates that vary primarily by whether this is a single injection, a bolus injection, or a two-day lysis involving three separate injections. For a multi-day injection, of course, the needles are removed much like a intrathecal pump trial, but the catheters remain in place. Very. What we always start with is 10 milliliters of non-ionic water-soluble contrast which is injected, as we mentioned, to confirm the site of the scar. Sometimes we make multiple passes with the catheter to mechanically disrupt the scars, and we're injecting again laterally through the side ports to help to disrupt the adhesions. Following this, of course, while we're doing this procedure, we're aiming to see runoff. Uh, we're injecting a large volume. We do not want to create a space-occupying lesion, so we have to ensure that we're seeing runoff through the foramina typically uh, while injecting our contrast. And in the sacral spine, you'll see a very nice... Christmas tree pattern. After that, we typically inject uh, one eighth percent marcaine. And following that, we inject a combination of hyaluronidase mixed in normal saline. Hyaluronidase, again, is the enzyme that helps to cleave uh, glycosidic bonds. And following that, we monitor for a motor block. We're very, very conscientious in of ensuring that we are not subdural before going any further with the procedure. Uh, after waiting about 20 minutes, if there is no motor block, then we to inject a combination of additional lidocaine, sometimes also marcaine, and then we inject a mixture of hypertonic saline. Hypertonic saline at 10% concentration is the most effective per a study by Burke and Meyer in 2011 at reducing uh, human fibroblast activity. And hypertonic saline is a little bit tough to come by. Typically, concentrations come in 23.4%, and that's very corrosive to vessels. That concentration is often used to sclerose varicose veins, for example. So we dilute that with 1% uh, lidocaine, and that gives us a and six milliliters of 1% lidocaine with four milliliters of 23.4% normal saline, or sorry, um, sodium chloride, gives us our 10% hypertonic saline mixture. And of course, we flush the catheter at the end. And this order is done so that the hypertonic saline, which is normally very, very painful, does not uh, irritate the patient. If we're doing a multi-day lysis, of course, we leave the catheter in place and we do that same procedure, uh, just the injectates, typically with marcaine and then hypertonic saline later that same afternoon. And then again, the next morning. And that's a, a three series of injections. This would refer to as a multi-day lysis with a 62263 CPT code. After the procedure, of course, that's when the real work begins. Patients are expected to engage rigorously in physical therapy. Their emphasis should be on neural flossing, where we're ensuring that there is movement of the nerve roots, that they're free from perineural scars that we've hopefully lysed successfully, and that there is uh, no excess tension on the nerve roots. And of course, during the procedure, pre-procedurally, pre we give typically a gram of uh, ceftriaxone, 
And after the procedure as well, we're typically placing the patients on uh, antibiotics, most often Leviquin, uh, for about five days, 500 milligrams daily. Some of the recent data that supports these studies are shown here. Of course, this is this procedure has been around since 1989 before I was alive. The, it has been extensively studied. Some of the most recent studies are listed here. Um, I'll start with the first one that in 2014 was Tomikichi Matsumoto, who described a prospective trial of 36 patients, almost all of whom had significantly improved VAS scores and ODI through 12-month follow-up after a lumbar epidural lysis of adhesions. Uh, Laxmaya Machikanti is a prominent interventional pain physician and president of ASIP. He has by himself completed at least a dozen of such studies, but uh, here's a meta-analysis that he presented in 2019. And at all time points, including three, six, and 12-month endpoints, he showed significant improvement in NRS pain and ODI on average when comparing uh, two randomized control trials, two prospective trials, and two retrospective trials. And most recently, a uh, study by Ludger Gerdesmeyer in 2021 uh, presented a 10-year follow-up for a double-blind sham-controlled randomized control trial uh, with significant improvement to ODI and VAS scores for the treatment group at 10-year follow-up. There was, of course, some loss to follow-up, as can be imagined, with a 10-year time frame. Uh, but all of those findings were significant as they were for each of these three studies mentioned. In this case, interestingly, the sham control was a subcutaneously placed catheter. So patients weren't aware of whether they had uh, the actual lysis procedure or just had a catheter placed under the skin. So during our time together, we discussed the history of the procedure, specific indications for it, the instruments used very briefly, access technique, the injectates and post-procedural care. I'll take the last 30 seconds of my presentation to give a small tribute to some of my mentors. These are two of my great mentors and two of the greatest virtuosos that I know. On the left, of course, is Dr. Gabor Rax, with whom I practice at Virtuoso Spine and Joint in Dallas. He remains a source of inspiration. He is uh, he teaches me something new every single day, and he's an amazing person to have the opportunity to work with. In the middle is my piano teacher, Ruth Slinchinska. She was a child prodigy. She was a touring artist at age five. She made her or orchestral debut at age six, and she's recorded over 30 years. She's credited with one of the longest performing arts career across any field. Two weeks ago, she turned 98. And I was with her for that uh, event. And uh, at 97, about 11 months ago, she released her latest album, which was the top of the charts on Amazon. And this is uh, an opportunity for my two worlds to collide where medicine and music met. And this is uh, Dr. Rax with Madam Slinchinska about two Christmases ago. So I'm very blessed. And I'd love to show you just a little bit of my references and open the floor to questions. Again, our procedural technique overview is very brief. 